Hello, welcome to Legal Action. My name is David Siegel. Thanks for joining us. Today we're going to be talking about debt relief, in particular, taking questions from our viewers over the recent months. I want to welcome in Jesse Barrientes, my co-host. Jesse, how are you doing today? Very good, Dave. How about yourself? I'm doing well, sir. Well, we've had a lot of people reach out in the last few months with all kinds of debt relief questions, because they know that's a topic that we cover. So let's jump in and try and answer some of these questions for our viewers in, in a rapid form fashion, okay? Sure. It's you know it's a trying time. It's difficult uh, all over. Uh, you know everybody's feeling the crunch, and well, they just want help. Yeah, I don't think things are getting any better, Jesse. We've got uh, unemployment still hovering. Uh, housing is maybe hitting the bottom, maybe starting to recover, but that doesn't do a, a lot for people who've lost their job and have right. already fallen behind on their mortgage. It's going to take a while. Yeah, everybody has taken a two percent payroll hit, uh, thanks to the Congress not renewing or allowing the payroll holiday to expire. So everyone across the board who's getting paid on a payroll check got a 2% decrease as of late. So everyone has less money, and the money they had before wasn't even enough to cover the spread. Yeah, less money in their pocket, more money going out. As you know, the postage rates just went up. That's true. I remember just uh, updating my uh, Pitney Bowes machine. Yeah, gas at the time of this airing is about $3.60 a gallon? Yeah, 65, yep, 365, about, about, about uh, there. Food costs are exploding. And uh, intended to go higher. Yeah, and we still have no jobs. So we're in a real tough time. So I'm not surprised that there, there's this many people reaching out with questions on how to get on top of things, how to either turn themselves around with a fresh start or come up with some form of payment plan because there's garnishments going on and yep. lawsuits and collection <clears throat> efforts and harassment from bill collectors day and night, automated on the cell phone, at work, they're even calling family members well, looking the, for you. There's the Fair Debt Collection uh, Act, and I mean, that's, I think, something that we addressed on a previous show and, and all that, but even you know, other people, I mean, they're doing what they can to collect what people, oh, I mean, you know, everybody has a job to do, and now, of course, they need to stay abreast of the law. Yeah, the act goes a long way to stop uh, unscrupulous bill collectors, but if you're, you have a legitimate debt that they're collecting on, and they call you within a reasonable hour, they're doing what yeah. Uh, Unless you tell them. them not to call or you tell them in writing not to call or you have an attorney, uh, you don't have a whole lot of protection there against them if they're doing their job under the law. Yeah, true enough. So things are tough. So what do you have? Why don't you start it out for me, Jesse? Well, let's see. Uh, Lyle and Cicero says, I have two mortgages but don't want to pay the second mortgage but still keep the house. Can I eliminate that second mortgage in Chapter 7? This happens a lot where someone has a first mortgage and a second mortgage and they can't make both payments. So they pick and choose. Now it's always better to pay the first because the first is in primary position and the second is very rarely going to institute a foreclosure action because they're basically going to be extinguishing their own lien in favor of the primary. So in a chapter seven, if you want to keep your house, you're going to have to make both the first and second. You're not able to pick and choose because either one can foreclose although it's much more likely that the first mortgage is going to bring suit. But Chapter 7 is not the kind of chapter that you want to file if you're trying to eliminate one of the mortgages. That's what I was going to ask in you. Unless you're trying to walk away from the house. That's a different story. Then you could certainly file 7, pay nobody, and give up the house eventually six months or a year down the road. Can you strip the second mortgage in a Chapter 13? You can if the second mortgage is completely unsecured. And what I mean by that is the amount owed on the first mortgage has to exceed the market value of the property. If the second mortgage is completely unsecured, meaning the first mortgage eats up all of the equity, then that mortgage can be stripped. And when you strip it, you're not eliminating it entirely. You're taking away the lien. You're taking away the obligation to pay a second mortgage. But the second mortgage becomes an unsecured creditor, and it will get paid something, maybe 10 cents on the dollar, 20 cents on the dollar. It basically changes its character from a secured lien to an unsecured debt, just like a medical bill, credit card, personal loan, utility bill, auto deficiency, repossession. So regardless of it being attached to, uh, to a second mortgage, it doesn't matter. So essentially, what I am understanding you to say for our people at home there is that if the value of my property is $150,000 and on the first 
mortgage, the primary mortgage, I owe 175000 and on the second one, I owe another fifty. I'm able to possibly strip that second mortgage. And what that means is, right, because in a Chapter 13, it's consolidation or partial repayment, and you pay your, cons your secured creditors 100% throughout the duration of the plan, and your unsecured as little as 10%, all the way on up to 100%. So right. basically, I might have to, if it's $50,000, the, the best that I could hope for, if that were the, the case, they would be in that position and it would be as little as 5000 bucks. Right. And this is a very unique time in history for stripping mortgages. I and mean, this was unheard of before because uh, real estate was escalating. So if you got a second mortgage or a line of credit to pay right. off other debt, the value of your property kept increasing. Lenders were in no way at risk of losing their lien. We're now with so many houses underwater, so many people uh, unable to pay for their obligations. This is when people afford themselves with the Chapter 13 laws that really lien stripping is just something new. It was always available. It just didn't occur because the market didn't produce it. Right. And we're seeing it more and more these days. And lenders aren't even fighting it. They know that the house is completely underwater. They're not even arguing valuation. It's not even a close call. Good yeah. enough. Let me give you one, Jesse. We got sure. uh, Lisa from Arlington Heights. <clears throat> Can I lose my house if I'm behind? <coughs> Excuse me. On my first mortgage. Well, that's uh, <coughs> that really depends, because I mean, sure you can. However. There are a lot of things going on, as you mentioned, in terms of the market and everything else. A lot of people are trying to do these loan modifications. And unfortunately, a lot of the lenders won't allow you to even initiate the process unless you're behind. And you have people, and it's something I didn't understand, because you have people that are reaching out. They want to pay for their mortgage, and they, they want to avail themselves of that process before they're under the gun, before they're behind. But they're not willing to do it until that time is up. So. A lot of times, the lenders may work with you, all right? And so in that case, if you're behind and you do a loan modification in Chapter 7, all right, they may allow you, you be able to do that as long as you meet other qualifications, as long as you don't make uh, more than uh, the, the statute allows you to do, and as long as uh, you don't have more equity than you're allowed to have, you might be able to do that. But if you owe money on your mortgage and you file a bankruptcy, there is a possibility that you can lose it. However, if you're doing a Chapter 13 and you're able to do one, and, and what that means is after your allowable expenses, you have enough money left over at the end of the month to fund the plan. And what happens is that your arrearage, whatever the mortgage arrearage is, goes into the big kitty. And uh, for example, your car, if you own your car and you're not leasing, that whole amount goes into it. All your secured credit uh, debts go into that kitty. Your unsecured credits go, uh, or debts go into that kitty too. But again, as we spoke a little bit earlier, you know, you only are obligated to pay as little as 10% all the way up to 100%, depending upon what you have left at the end of the, your allowable expenses. So in that case, if you have enough left for 36 or 60 months uh, to be able to pay, you know, you will not lose your home. However, How many of the people that come to see you actually have money available at the end of the month? It, it's really far and few between. However, I have seen people that and, and again, it's, it's something that I just don't understand. The money is there. They just need to cut out a lot of the fat. And I've had several people that came in, actually, that it's a 100% plan, uh, meaning that not only at the end of the day, at the end of their plan period, uh, are they going to pay back their uh, secured creditors 100%, but they're unsecured. But the good news for them is that they're paying back their debts 100%. They don't have to worry about penalties and interest. And if it's a 100% plan, a lot of times the trustees will allow you to make a lesser payment for a, an extended duration rather than living slimly and just making it for that period of time when it really is going to be tough living. All right, you do have to pay a 3 to 5% administrative fee to the trustee who takes all the disbursements and makes all Correct. the disbursements and keeps track of all the payments and makes sure that people are not filing late claims and whatnot. So there is some interest, but 
obviously a whole lot less than a high interest credit card. And then you don't have to worry about people calling you, you don't have to worry about any of those things. And at the end of your plan, all of those things will be taken care of and, play, uh, and, and paid and you could get on. You don't have to worry about the anxiety about these calls and you know worry about uh, consolidation that doesn't have the backing and the strength of the federal laws. Absolutely. Dave, uh, here's one from Terry from Chicago. It says, if I file for bankruptcy, can it stop my garnishment? Yes, Chapter 7 or Chapter 13 will stop a garnishment. Uh, what happens is once a case is filed, there's an automatic stay which is created, which is a, a legal term which basically states a case has been filed and the protection of the bankruptcy law kicks in. The automatic stay is a one-page document that we prepare. We send it, fax it, email it to your employer, as well as to whichever creditor or creditor's attorney is doing the garnishing. So what happens, because again, so if people can get an idea what a garnishment is, if you owe money, you have a judgment, and they file what they call supplementary proceedings, and they attach to your bank uh, or to your, to your wages, and you make enough wages to be able to pay that. Now, what happens if the employer, previous to the filing of the bankruptcy, has got this uh, little bucket of wages um, you know, that they've been withholding from your check, and they haven't quite sent it out to the judgment creditor. Okay, any money that's pulled out of the person's check but has not been turned over to the creditor belongs to the creditor. The filing of the bankruptcy will stop the withholdings. Any further withholdings. Any further withholdings. But whatever's been pulled out prior to the filing, even though it hasn't been turned over to the creditor, needs to be turned over to the creditor. It used to be back in the day there was a return date, and if you filed before the return date, that whole nest egg that was pulled out would come back to the debtor. They changed the law on that. Anything that comes out prior to the date of filing is gone. It needs to go to the creditor. And if your employer doesn't do it or doesn't turn it over, the creditor can get a conditional judgment against the employer. So now the employer's on the hook for it. So it's, it's very powerful, but the date of filing is the controlling date. And that's why it's really important for people to understand that, hey, they need to have the whatever attorney they talk to, they need to be able to, to file it. So they need pretty much whatever that fee is to be able to get it started because if it hasn't been filed, you have no protection. Right. And keep in mind, 15% is the guideline that they're going to deduct, depending on what your income is. If it's much lower, then it or, won't be as high. But 15% is a lot of money to be taken out of your check, and it's usually a make or break situation for people. In fact, nothing will make the phones ring quicker to a lawyer for debt relief than a garnishment. Okay? It's devastating. We talked about a 2% decrease oh, and how yeah. that's hurting people. Sure. Imagine 15% coming out of your pay for something that you really may not even owe that much anymore. It could be interest, fees, penalties. You know, you might not have incurred that much debt, but you're going to be paying back quite a bit Well, it's now. all that. They, exactly. When they, when they go ahead and file, it includes all that stuff. And a lot of times, people are just simply defaulted, which means they never show up. Yeah. Well, why don't you tell the viewers what happens if you don't show up? Because well, there are some drastic consequences if you don't show there up are. for court there are. proceeding. Pe pe people should know. Listen, do not stick your head in the sand. If you get a summons, you have to address it. You might not like it, but you have to address it. Everything will turn out the way that it's going to turn out. But if you don't address it and you don't go and you don't get counsel, bad things are going to happen. If you don't show up, then your the plaintiff, the judgment uh, creditor, is going to get the relief that that person is seeking, even though you might have a defense, or even though the amount that they're seeking is not consistent with your records in terms of things that you've made. Well, and so it's important that you go. A lot of times, Dave, what will happen is when you go, it depends on which county. A lot of judges are different, but the judge will ask you, do you owe the money? And if you say yes and you agree that you owe the money, you could talk to the plaintiff's attorney and they could work out an installment agreement. And notice they're not even under oath at the time that the judge will That's typically true. Ask, ask that question. Exactly. Exactly. And so you can make that installment agreement and if you agree to pay whatever it is for a period of time, then you're good. If you fail to do that, then they can go back in. <coughs> and then they can get a judgment for the full amount and then continue to proceed. So it's imperative, unless of course you're going to file a bankruptcy. If, if your, your court date is next Friday and you come in and everything is done and we're ready to file this on a Wednesday, it would really, really doesn't matter. Right, Dave? Okay, what about after they have the judgment and they bring a citation to discover assets? 
What if you don't go to those court appearances? Then what's the consequence? If you don't go to those uh, court appearances, the consequence is the body attachment. In other words, you're going to be arrested and the amount of your bond is going to be set at the amount that you owe uh, and not 10% of it. It's going to be exactly what that is. However... What do you it, mean they attach your body? Well, they're Explain going... Explain that in non-legal terms for the viewers. The body attachment is a warrant. It's an arrest warrant, essentially. A civil for failure to warrant. show up in court. For failure to show up. It's not, not for the money that you owe. Right. We, debtor, debtor's prison is long gone, but it's because you didn't, uh, you didn't show up. But there are conditions. You have to have been served personally with the uh, citation of discovery assets. However, if you have already filed a bankruptcy and they serve you with that, now they're in violation of the bankruptcy stay, and now they need to call you, and you can avail the bankruptcy uh, or avail the, the debtor of the <coughs> bankruptcy court protection, and uh, the, the creditors can get in severe trouble. Yeah, just as a side note, Jesse, you're involved in the technology of law practices, correct? Yes, that's, that's okay. correct. Well, just recently in Cook County and other counties already have this, they've prohibited cell phones to enter into the building, period. Now, what's your view on this? Because some people need that cell phone for transportation, for work, and to leave it at home and not have the ability to even get into court. For example, someone on a citation or a rule to show cause. Uh, What's your opinion on this? Well, uh, what, what are the judges afraid of? Uh, well, I'll tell you. I don't know that they're afraid of anything, but I will tell you this: that you know, recordings. It, it doesn't. It doesn't apply to to attorneys because uh, as an attorney, you're an officer of the court, and that's how transact business. Uh, the judge can, depending upon the case. Uh, if it's, for example, an order of protection, the judge can sign an order allowing you to retrieve your cell phone. But the problem that they had in Cook County anyway, according to what, uh, what has been reported, was that uh, during a lot of cases, uh, particularly criminal cases, that jurors were being recorded and there was the fear of retribution and retaliation, that people were inside testifying and that people in the courtroom were texting to people who were getting ready to testify, to testify as to what that testimony is. A lot of times when we go in, we do what we call a motion to exclude witnesses because I don't want someone who's going to testify, and long, unless it's the party, to hear what this person is going to say because their testimony is probably going to be different. Uh, and so that's what that's well, seeking to prevent. I can prevent. understand if there's a trial going on and they don't want the witnesses to be able to communicate to prohibit the cell phones at that time. But somebody appearing on a traffic matter, a small claims case, a divorce case, a probate case, there's no reason in the world why they can't have their cell phone with them. Well, they can, they can leave it in their car. I've seen people... No, they took the bus, Jesse. Well, well then... Well, or I, they took the train. I, 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 I'll there's tell you. There's nowhere to leave it. Well, you know what? Let me tell you. I've seen people um, put them in hide them, which obviously it might be there when you get back, might not be there when you get back. Um, I've seen people hide them. You're not hiding your new iPhone. No, no. I've That's seen people. Happening. I've seen people hide them in, in planters and actually come and retrieve them. I've actually seen people do that. Perhaps the answer is to maybe have a uh, uh, have a row of lockers like they have at some health clubs where you put 25 cents or 50 cents. Again, another money generating idea uh, to be yeah. able to lock your cell phone away and come and retrieve it because the sheriff's office will not be responsible yeah. for that. I don't want to get off the, the topic of the show, but it's just troubling that you have a public building paid for by the taxpayers and the judges are protecting themselves that there could be no video and no sound recording. Whereby, you know, a recent case just passed where a police officer came to the car and he or she was videotaped and it was held constitutional. So if it's good enough to record a police officer who's approaching your car, it should be good enough for a high-paid judge who sits in an honorary position in the county. Oh, no, wait a minute. I believe they have pilot programs with respect to cameras in the courtroom, so we'll just have to see how all that pans out. Yeah, very good. Okay, uh, Jamie from Barrington, Jesse, wants to know if he can get his car back. It was recently repossessed for failure to pay. Jamie's going to be taking the bus. Um, it is unlikely that he's going to be able to get his, after it's been repossessed, Repossessed, not sold. Well, if, it's, if it hasn't been sold, there's a possibility. However, once it's been repossessed, you're going to be pretty much out of luck. They may want, if you're, especially if you're going to reaffirm on that obligation, which means that despite the bankruptcy, you're going to continue to pay. 
it is a possibility, but there are some lenders out there that are not going to take that chance and they don't care. They have the car, you haven't paid what you were supposed to pay, and that's the end of that. Certainly after it's sold, you're out of luck. Yeah, well, let's say it's not sold yet and you want to do a 13, you want to reorganize it. Remember, it's not sold. Can you get right. it back under the Thompson case? If you do a 13, you may be able to get it back. I think that that is a possibility. However, you also want to think about whether or not it is realistic for you to do that. Most people are upside down. Most everyone I've seen that come in has a balance owed of maybe fifteen thousand or twenty or twenty-five thousand dollars, and the car is worth eight grand. I know you need transportation, but common sense has got to kind of win out yeah. someplace. Well, the cars are getting more and more reliable these days. So if people would just buy a, a lesser vehicle, I think they would be in good shape. Yeah. It's, it's the people that turn in old cars that have a balance and the, the financing And they charges. continue, yeah. again, it's the same, it gets perpetuated. They continue to build up that debt by doing those type of things. Yeah, that's where you need a fresh start. Yeah. All right, uh, we have uh, Suzanne from Crystal Lake. Can a creditor be able to take money out of my 401k? Well, Suzanne, you're in a good situation because you have money in your 401k, which is great. Uh, the truth is creditors cannot touch that. That is protected. It's exempt under the state of Illinois laws, and you could eliminate plenty of debt. It could even be hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of debt, and the money in your 401k is protected. So you can rest assured if you're putting money into your retirement or a pension or some other form of profit sharing, you're going to be protected. And that's basically what happened to O.J. Simpson when there was a civil judgment against him. They really had no way of collecting it because a lot of his income was from his pension and his retirement. So, so if I had $800,000 in my pension, creditors can't touch it. That is correct. As long as you leave it in that account, and as long as that's not commingled with a, a non-pension account. So even the draws that I get? So if I'm getting money, if I'm retired, I'm getting money from my retirement? Yeah, it's protected. It is. Uh, Stanley in Des Plaines, Jesse, wants to know... What does a trustee do in a Chapter 13 case? What's a their role? Anything he wants to do. <laughs> no, it's not sure. true. He's got a code and a uh, That's true. law he has to follow. <laughs> Just a little Huber, yes. <laughs> the trustee is responsible for the administration of the estate. It's an estate. And so what happens is, again, just think of it as just one, one big, it's, it's about division of property and, and, and managing it and taking care of it. So what happens is the trustee is responsible, one, for investigating the voluntary uh, or involuntary petition, uh, whether or not it's Chapter 7 or Chapter 13, to make sure that they feel comfortable that the, uh, the debtor is, is telling the truth. And uh, not only that, but in different cases, like in a Chapter 7 where someone wants to dump the property and it needs to be sold and liquidated, or in a Chapter 13, it just depends. Uh, or if you have a lawsuit against somebody that's viable and uh, they could uh, retrieve uh, uh, enough money to be able to take care of it, then they're responsible for liquidating that property to get it into a realtor's hands to be able to pay the creditors depending upon their priority and depending upon whether or not they're secured or unsecured. Uh, or if it's that lawsuit, um, they're responsible to either to prosecute it or if there's already an attorney prosecuting it, they probably will allow that person to continue to do that, but to maintain control over it so that the creditors get paid back what they're entitled to under the code, but also so that the debtor will get what he or she uh, or they uh, are entitled to under the code too. So there's an exemption. So if a property is sold and they have equity in the property, they're entitled to their exemption, which would be you know fifteen thousand dollars a piece. And uh, as long as they sold it for uh, for uh, above that amount, they would uh, most likely be able to get that money. Is the trustee someone the debtor should fear? No, uh, the trustee, and a lot of people do fear the debtor but, or the the trustee because he's uh, or she is in a position of authority. They shouldn't fear that person. That person is there to do his or her job, really. Now, just like anybody else, there are good people and there are bad people, and we all have good and bad days. But that person is really there to administer that estate, and nothing more and nothing less. Should the debtor feel that the trustee is going to come through their home and investigate their household goods and things of that nature? The trustee... And, you know, most likely is not going to that. I mean, I can envision where there might be a question of fraud or, or something of that nature where they may employ an investigator. 
Uh, that is certainly possible, but generally there are too many people filing for bankruptcy, and generally that's not going to happen. Even in DuPage County? Even in DuPage County, absent extremely exigent circumstances. Okay. Yeah. Dave, uh, we actually, oh, this is a good one. We've already uh, answered that, but it says uh, from Darius from Lockport, my car was uh, repoed a month ago. Can I still be able to get it back? We talked about that, so that seems to be also yeah. a very hot topic. People, People's cars, do you know they even have a game show? Uh, on television now in terms of being repoed. And if you ask so many questions, they pay it off and you get your car. If you don't, they tow it. Is that right? Yeah, I, I, I couldn't believe it. Anyway, James from Blue Island says, can I put my student loans in the bankruptcy? Student loans are a non-dischargeable debt, so they would not be eliminated in a Chapter 7, although it's sometimes a good idea to do a Chapter 7 anyway and eliminate what you can and then be able to repay the ones that are not eliminated. In a 13, however, you can put a student loan in there. It's just not going to pay off 100% necessarily. You it's might, possible, though. It's possible if you can pay it off in the next 60 months, because so, that's as far as we can stretch it. But I don't have to pay it off in the 60 months. No, you don't have to. You can restrict it, let's say, down to 10 cents on the dollar for the three- to five-year payment plan. However, at the end of your payment plan, you're going to owe the other 90% plus interest. So student loans do not go away. So if you can pay them back in the 13 over 60 months, I recommend you do that. Along with everything else, and then if you owe more after that, you just continue to pay them. Yeah, what's interesting is you can't differentiate between a student loan and a credit card and a medical bill. So you can't say to the trustee, I'm going to pay back the student loan 100% through my 13 and pay the other creditors 10. They all have to be part of the same class. They're all unsecured creditors. So if you're going to pay one 10%, they're all going to get 10% but you're still going to owe the, owe the other 90 to on the, the student IRS. loans. Or the IRS, or, or, or depending, either, on how, either one, exactly. depending on right. what taxes. Sure. Oh, you got IRS on your mind? We're coming up on that day, aren't we? Uh, we, we are indeed. <laughs> okay, I see where you're going here. All right, Jesse, we have uh, Chris from Joliet wants to know, how do you figure out how much I have to pay back in a Chapter 13 bankruptcy case? Well, I will tell you, again, we've talked about it, and it is essentially... 100% of your secured creditors and as little as 10% up to 100% of your unsecured creditors between 36 to 60 months. It all depends on the uh, available amount that you have after your allowable expenses. Now when I say allowable expenses, the federal government has certain expenses that are allowable. Just take for example food. For one person it's $350 a month. Now it seems kind of slim to me. We're both bigger guys. I don't know that 350 a month would uh, would do it. However, uh, and it's fifty dollars for each additional. Anybody who has kids know that they eat more than that. It's really the skinny people who can eat all of the time and not gain any weight that you know that have all of the responsibilities. Yeah, no, there's just many people there, that can go through 350 in a week in a groceries. week. So, so that's the allowable expenses. So, uh, to answer the question, it just depends. They have to do the calculations, and after whatever that amount is, then they kind of calculate it out based upon what you owe and based upon the 3% that you have to pay to the, the trustee and also based upon what you're paying to your attorney because more than likely, if it's Chapter 13, your, mo the bulk of your attorney's fees are going to be paid through the plan as well. Yeah, but it's worth exploring because you're going to go through their budget, you're going to go through their expenses, their income. Absolutely. And kind of propose what a possible plan payment or amount that has right. to be paid to the trustee would be. And then they can make a, an intelligent decision on whether or not right. they can afford it and whether it's a good idea to restrict their creditors and reorganize. Right. So it's something you'll help with. It is. And then also, you know, you have when you go in for uh, for the approval of that plan, the trustee is going to look at different things. One thing they really hit sometimes is if you're taking out money for your pension and it is a voluntary pension, they're probably going to require you to stop that during that period of time so that it provides more, unless it's a 100% plan. If it's a 100% plan, then I don't see them really doing that. But again, they just want to make sure that, hey, everything's according to Hoyle. Yeah, interestingly, you can give a lot to charity. You can give a lot to your church or other religious organization. And we recommend that you do. On several levels. Yes. Okay. All right, Jesse, thanks for being with me today as All a right, co-host. You've been watching Legal Action. We've been talking about debt relief. We'll see you next time. Take care. Yeah.